So now we've covered enough ground to see that gold is money. The stocks of gold above ground are huge, and all of the gold produced by the mining industry is readily accepted by those who want to use it as a store of value. Gold is meant to generate a return, so it is not a fallow asset. It is desired and has its own interest rate. Today, we'll turn our attention away from the incentives of those who might wish to borrow gold to the incentives of the people who wish to lend it. In my last video, I discussed at a very high level the general mechanics of gold forwards and swaps. Let's now put a finer point on it. What I'm showing you here is the six-month GOFO, or gold forward offered rate, from 1990 up until the LBMA stopped publishing it in January of 2015. Simply put, the GOFO is the interest rate on a gold for dollar swap. If someone wants to pledge their gold as collateral to borrow dollars, this is the effective interest rate that they will pay for borrowing those dollars. Again, the mechanics of this operation are that the gold owner will sell gold at spot for the dollars, and then enter into a forward agreement with someone to sell the same amount of gold in return at some date in the future for a certain amount of money. The GOFO is invariably always positive. Now, obviously mobilizing gold to obtain dollars is not a cost-free operation. Why would someone want to do it? Well, first we should ask why the person just wouldn't want to sell their gold at spot and forget about the forward contract to recover the gold. The answer is obvious. The person who is mobilizing their gold wants it back. They would like to maintain their principal balance in gold. But then, if it costs more dollars to get the gold back in the future than can be obtained from selling at spot, why do it at all? The answer to this question has to do with how the return is generated. We can plot the six-month LIBOR rate on the same chart to see that there is a gap between LIBOR and GOFO. LIBOR is the London Interbank Offered Rate, which is the interest rate at which banks lend dollars to each other. Notice that LIBOR is generally always higher than GOFO. The difference between the two is the gold lease rate. It is the interest rate that can be generated by lending gold. Again, the mechanics are sell gold at spot, enter into a forward contract to get the gold back in the future, and then lend the dollars out at interest. It works for the gold holder because a loan collateralized with gold is much less risky than a loan collateralized in any other way. At least that's the way that the bullion banks clearly see it. This is another bit of evidence that gold is highly valued. We can see that just before 1990, the gold lease rate went negative. But this didn't persist for long, because it was a situation in which there was absolutely no incentive for someone with gold to bid for dollars. The dollar interest rate was clearly too low. But notice that the situation was quickly resolved by rapidly rising interest rates. Put a pin in that and keep it in your mind for later. Notice also that before 2001, the gold lease rate was generally between 1 and 2%, but the gap between LIBOR and GOFO closed uh, between 2001 and 2003 until the gold lease rate became virtually non-existent. Whereas before 2001, there was incentive for the private holder of gold to mobilize his gold, bid for dollars, and generate an interest rate, after 2003, the incentive was virtually gone. And this zero lease rate did not only apply to when the interest rates were driven virtually down to zero, even in the mid-2000s, when LIBOR was back to 5%, the gold lease rate was virtually zero. All money bids for other money. Without such a bid, exchange rates blow up, and the currency that goes bidless declines. So I ask you now this question. It is important for gold to bid for dollars, but if the economic incentive for gold to bid for dollars goes away, what are we left with? I'll give you a moment to think about it. If you answered, you're left with a non-economic incentive for gold to bid for dollars, you're absolutely right. And when we seek out non-economic actors, the obvious place to look is government. Remember this guy? This was Alan Greenspan, who was Federal Reserve Chairman from 1987 to 2006. In 1998, he was quoted as saying, but unlike farm crops, especially near the end of a crop season, private counterparties in oil contracts have virtually no ability to restrict the worldwide supply of this commodity. Even OPEC has been less than successful over the years. Nor can private counterparties restrict supplies of gold. 
another commodity whose derivatives are often traded over the counter, where central banks stand ready to lease gold in increasing quantities should the price rise. And then a year later, we heard a similar sentiment echoed by Eddie George, then governor of the Bank of England. He said, We looked into the abyss if the gold price rose further. A further rise would have taken down one or several trading houses, which might have taken down the rest in their wake. Therefore, at any price, at any cost, the central banks had to quell the gold price, manage it. So this establishes the willingness of central banks to step in as the gold lender of last resort. If private gold holders decide that they are not going to bid for dollars, either because they have lost faith in the currency, because they have lost faith in the paper system to function and return their gold to them, or simply because they find the interest rate on the dollar loan to be unattractive, then the central banks are the only ones with enough gold available and a lack of economic incentive to step in. And this is probably what's been going on now for the past 20 years. One might ask themselves, just how long can this go on? Let's see if we can find signs of stress. Even though GOFO stopped being published in 2015, we can still reconstruct it by using the LBMA spot fix price and the COMEX futures price. After all, if LBMA and COMEX prices are inconsistent, then there would be an arbitrage possibility that would be exploited to bring them back in line. Using LIBOR to reconstruct lease rates, we can see that from 2011 to 2020, the lease rates were virtually zero. Private gold holders had no incentive to mobilize their gold. But then in March of 2020, we see a curiosity that the lease rates have gone strongly negative. This is because LIBOR is still near zero due to the central bank's driving dollar interest rates to zero. Meanwhile, the future uh, term structure for gold is strongly positive. If central banks have been actively leasing gold for the past 20 years, then up until early this year, it hasn't benefited them, but it also hasn't cost them. Right now, it appears that the cost is very high. Either they will have to increase dollar interest rates, or they will have to withdraw their bid of their gold for the dollar. We'll see what happens. And as Anne Rand once said, we can choose to ignore reality, but we cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. <laughs>